Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota, produced by Lakeland PBS with host Bethany Wesley. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals, online at niswatax.com. Hello, welcome back to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. The Minnesota Legislature will convene for its regular session on Tuesday. Legislators will come together in St. Paul as the state faces a projected deficit of $188 million based on a November economic forecast. An updated forecast is expected later this month. Tonight, I welcome to our table two area legislators to discuss some of the issues and topics expected to be debated and perhaps acted upon before the May 21st deadline. Representative Matt Bliss, a Republican from Pennington, represents District 5A. He is a small business owner serving his first term and will be up for re-election this fall. Bliss is the vice chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee and also serves on the Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Finance Committee, the Government Operations and Elections Policy Committee, and a subcommittee on mining, forestry, and tourism. Senator Justin Eichhorn, a Republican from Grand Rapids, represents District 5. He also is a small business owner serving his first term, but as senator will not be up for re-election until 2020. Eichhorn is the vice chair of the E-12 Policy Committee and also serves on the following committees. Capital Investment, E-12 Finance, Environment and Natural Resources Finance, and Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Thanks for having us. This is a great opportunity. Our intention today is to kind of look forward to the session that is coming, what people can expect to hear about and hear kind of debated. But then also as a part of that, we'll probably touch on some of the things that were done last year. So first things first, I'm sure in your eyes, is you guys need a budget. Yep, absolutely. If we don't, uh, at least on the Senate side, if we don't get funded by the end of February, uh, we're, the Senate's going to pretty much be out of money. We borrowed some money from the Legislative Coordinating Committee in order to get to this point, but we do need Governor Dayton to approve the, the legislative budget in order to continue on. Otherwise, the session will probably end up having to stop. But I think there's a pretty favorable chance that we, we do get a budget signed. That'll be the first order of business, though. Were you worried or were you surprised when he vetoed the budget last year? I was surprised uh, that he had agreed to all the, the items that were in the budgets and, uh, and at the last minute he decided to veto our numbers, which really kind of put uh, our staff, our full-time staff, uh, both uh, partisan and nonpartisan, in kind of an awkward situation. Didn't know how long their jobs were going to be there. And as a result, we, uh, we had quite a bit of turnover in the House. I don't know how the Senate did, but we had a large turnover of people. But you guys were able to keep going, right? Because you found other funds to kind of keep you afloat until you can pass, hopefully, the budget then for yep, the days that's correct. to come. Correct. Okay. It's kind of, a, kind of a skeleton crew, so to speak, and that's why the Senate didn't do their bonding capital investment tours throughout the summer. Uh, we are working on those now, serving on that committee. I'm, I'm actually doing that next week. We're on our last little leg of our tour, so we are able to see some of those projects that are important to the state, and we were able to come through Bemidji here a couple weeks ago, and, and we had a really great uh, capital investment tour here. All right, so let's start moving to some of these topics. Um, the first one we'll talk about is probably a big one, taxes. Um, last year, your tax bill, if I remember correctly, was 600 or almost 650 million, right? In yep. different in different savings over the next two years. Mm -hmm. um, but this year, there's going to be some discussion in terms of how to manage the code in response to the federal. Correct, a, a tax conformity bill. Okay, so tell me, what are you hearing? What are you expecting to kind of be the main points down at the Capitol? Well, I would say that uh, a lot of people were saying Minnesota was kind of a leader in, in some tax reform. It was a couple decades since we had done tax reform in the state of Minnesota. And we made a lot of big uh, gains last year. I mean, we got uh, for Social Security income, for you know tax credits for students, money in uh, payment in lieu of taxes, and Indian Child Welfare Act to help the small counties. Small business owners. Small business owners. So we did a lot of really good things. So the state of Minnesota really led. And from what I've been hearing, they would like us to continue to be a leader. We need to, at the bare minimum, conform with the federal government. Otherwise, we're going to see some tax increases, most likely considering that Governor Dayton doesn't like tax bills. That was part of the reason our funding was vetoed, is he didn't like the tax bill. 
I don't think we get any farther than that personally, but I think there is some desire from members of both sides of the aisle to, to try to maybe push it a little farther and put that money back in Minnesotans' pockets so that way we can continue to grow our economy because even though we see the economy growing a little bit nationally, um, it, it hasn't jump-started as much as it has in other states, and I think there's probably some things we can do to help that along. One of the numbers that we've heard is the Minnesota Department of Revenue says that um, tax collections will grow by nearly $850 million in two years if, the, if no change is made to the policy, right. correct? Yes. So your goal is to change it so that that decreases? We, we want to make sure that the, the people uh, in Minnesota aren't negatively impacted by, by the federal cuts. Uh, one of the things that the federal government has done is make uh, the, the, the tax uh, credits or uh, your withholdings, your personal exemptions, they've doubled them, but they've taken away a lot of the uh, um, deductions in or in, to make up for it. And unfortunately, I, was, I heard yesterday from a farmer, if he turns in, uh, if he trades in a, a combine and he gets a $100,000 trade in, he has to now record that as income, which isn't a big deal because under the new federal policy, he can take 100% of that back off of his, his income. But on the state level, that doesn't come off of that. So uh, it, 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 that could negatively impact him. And that's what we have to look at is to make sure that the, the, the good tax cuts that were put in place in Washington don't negatively impact us. Okay. And we don't, we don't need the extra $800 million right now. So we, we should make sure that it, it impacts Minnesota as, as least as possible. You say that while, I mean, at this time, I know we're expecting a new forecast in, soon. But you do have a deficit. I mean, you are looking at a deficit. Do you worry about cutting them back to the point I, where that will increase? I, I did. I don't. Uh, the last two months have come back over projections. I, I think we'll be just fine. I think uh, that the, the tax cuts that we made last year and, and the president's tax cuts are starting to take effect, and I think we'll be just fine. And I think you're going to be surprised pleasantly at the, at the next forecast. Similar feelings? I completely agree with that. I, I do think we're probably going to be in a, in a surplus, maybe not a lot, but I do think we're going to have a much better forecast. I agree with the, the points that Representative Bliss made. Uh, we had some, some strong indications that it, that it is going to be better, and you know I'm hopeful for that, but we'll see when the numbers come yep. out. One of the things I want to kind of pull out from last year is uh, there was an increase to local government aid. Uh, you had an increase of about $15 million. Mm -hmm. um, You are hearing from some cities and some lobbyists that they would like to revisit that and have that go up again um, this year. What are your feelings on that and are you hearing from that? Is that something you're open to? I can tell you that that's something I worked on last year and that's something that went through our tax bill. That's a thing that a lot of people don't realize that tax bills aren't just about tax cuts you know it's, it's sold as oh it's tax cuts for rich people or whatever but there's a lot of other pieces at least in the Minnesota tax bill that go into that there's the local government aid went in there the county program aid was in there the Indian Child Welfare Act money was in there and on and on there were several things that helped fund local governments I think there is some desire to continue to help local governments, especially in Greater Minnesota. There's some disparities between what Greater Minnesota communities get and the metro communities. Mm -hmm. So there is some desire on in both chambers, I think, to continue to further that. It's just how much can we do? Uh, again, going into this tax bill that we're going to try to put together this year, if we go much beyond that conformity, we run into the point where Governor Dayton's not willing to sign it just because he has a distaste for tax bill. Okay. So it's hard to say for sure, but I, I do think there is possibly an opportunity. It's just a little smaller this year than in years coming forward. Okay. Yeah. Because I think what we've heard, or what you know, some if you've been reading, you know, coalitions asking to try to go back to those 2002 numbers, and other I think it's 30 and a half million, something like that. But you're saying you think it's probably a non-starter for this coming session. I don't know about a non-starter. It, it's it, the 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 appetite for that kind of a bill is probably not there right okay. now and yeah. and if you look at, at the history you know 2002 was the absolute peak you know of course we want to get back to the absolute peak but, but it has been growing over the past few years and I think you know we're gonna make steady progress on it whether or not it's the 2002 levels we'll, we'll wait and see okay. the discussion either way the discussion will certainly be there it's yeah. just how yeah. far we how can far actually it take it yeah okay. Um, I want to talk about bonding. It's an even numbered year, which usually is your big bonding year. Mm -hmm. Last year was an odd year in that you still had a bonding bill, but that was because it didn't get done the previous year. Correct. So you're back to a bonding year. So last year you had about nearly a billion dollars in roads and bridges and some local projects, uh, wastewater drinking systems. What are you hearing this year? We just had the bonding group up here to yep. look at BSU specifically. Yep. A couple and weeks ago we did, uh, we did the veterans home here as well. A lot of excitement around that project. 
and then we did the other side of the district about a week ago and I mean throughout Senate District 5 there's a lot of priorities and we saw a lot of those there's a lot of needs around heaper which is like asset preservation for the colleges there's a large desire to help uh, smaller communities in greater Minnesota with wastewater treatment needs as you mentioned uh, the city of Deer River has that okay. um, so we'd be looking forward to help them with that um, but on the bonding um, it, it's really interesting to actually be on the committee I've kind of referred to it sometimes as the wants and needs tour uh, we've seen a lot of swimming pools and mm -hmm. civic centers and gymnasiums which I, don't not have merit, but there's a lot of projects like the Veterans Home that we should really be looking at that really serve a regional and a statewide significance that that really matter to a larger portion of the state. And I think that's some of the intention of the bonding bills because you know, ultimately our kids are gonna end up paying that debt that we're taking out to build some of these projects. So we need to be mindful of that. And, and the price tag the governor came out with, with one and a half billion, I think is a little bit high. Okay. Um, in order to get some of the Republican members to go along with it, it's gonna to need to be under that billion dollar figure again. Um, but sitting on that committee again, I, I think there's a large desire for, you know, to do some things in higher ed and to help smaller Minnesota communities out with like, again, the wastewater treatment type stuff. So Dayton's bill, from what I understand, had a lot of emphasis on college and investments in that way and less so on local projects. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about that? Well, you know, I, my main focus obviously is the Bemidji Walker area. And I know part of the projects that we have uh, proposed up here is the Hag Sauer building in BSU. And, and I think, I believe that's number two on the, on the uh, Men's State's priority yes. list. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really going to go through. Um, you know, last year we, we tried to, to make it uh, geographically balanced and heavy on infrastructure. And, and I think that's kind of what we're going to focus on again this year. And, and try, like, like Justin said, you know, try to keep it uh, at a billion or under. Um, you know, th if you look closely at the governor's numbers, there's a lot of just numbers, 100 million for this, and it's just kind of a, a gray area that he just threw a number at. So I think we can whittle away at that quite okay. a lot, and uh, I, th I don't think there's a lot of difference in the numbers, really. I think he patted it any time you go into a negotiation, you want to pat a little bit to give away something. So I think I, I really have a good feeling that we'll come through with something this year. But you have a good feeling about getting some of those local projects absolutely. in as well as yes, so statewide. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. All Both right. Matt and I are advocating heavily for, for those projects, so I think we have a very good chance to get those in our, our bonding bill, especially the Veterans Home. I want to mention, because um, we've talked about Hag Sauer, which is $22.5 million for Hag Sauer and then some other buildings, but then also you have Red Lake, right? Red Lake is looking for some money for a school yeah. improvement. And, and that's, uh, that would be Matt Grossel's district, okay. uh, so that would be a project he's been yep. uh, pushing, so I don't know a okay. whole lot about that project. Okay. Sounds good. All right, then let's move on toward um, transportation. So last year you had $300 million for road and bridge projects. Last year, and you're hearing, of course, people always want more. So what do you expect for transportation in terms of, are, do you think there'll be anything to even discuss or no, you said maybe just sticking to that conformity for, for tax issues? Well, on tax issues, it's gonna stick to conformity. I don't think we're gonna, we're, we're not gonna raise any taxes. Uh, that's, that's definitely a non-starter, at least in the Senate, I assume it mm -hmm. is in the House as well. Um, but we do need to make sure we continue to dedicate those funds. Like last year, we, we dedicated some, the sales tax from like auto parts and stuff like that to make sure that went towards transportation. I think we need to make sure some of that is permanent. We need to make sure some of the additional uh, like auto uh, tax you pay when you buy your vehicle, that kind of stuff is always dedicated towards roads and bridges. We see that in, in different agencies, like in the DNR where you buy your fishing license, it goes to fishing. You buy your deer hunting license, mm -hmm. it goes to deer management and stuff like that. I think the intention of a lot of the taxpayers in Minnesota is that we use that money to go towards our roads and bridges and we've unfortunately raided those funds for many other things so I think we need to get back to that as a starter I know a lot of people would like to talk about additional gas taxes and stuff like that it's a non-starter for now I think that you know disproportionately affects lower income individuals and you know being that our economy hasn't fully recovered yet I don't think that's a place we we want to go at this point not a place I'm interested in going um, so yeah, we, we need to dedicate some more funds. There may be some funding in the bonding bill for <laughs> transportation. I don't know what that number looks like because there's a lot of competing projects, but sure. there will definitely be something in the realm of transportation. Okay. And, and I think we really want to uh, have the Department of Transportation focus more on congestion uh, and, and not, you know, maybe move, put bike paths along a, an artery. You know, let's focus on the congestion. Those are the people that pay the taxes for the roads. Let's, let's make sure that goes for roads and, and congestion relief. 
Do you believe it's hard to kind of get that balance between metro and rural projects when it comes to transportation? Do you feel like that's something that, you know, is always kind of an uphill battle? I mean, we always hear, you know, media southwest, you know, light rail, light rail, light rail, and up here, probably not going to affect us much. So mm -hmm. how do you go about having those conversations? Well, I was looking at an interesting thing. I was actually looking at this earlier today at what light rail costs compared in for, for a mile compared to like what a mile of four lane highway costs up here. Light rail is about 100 million a mile. Up here, it's about 225 to 250,000 a mile if you were going to build in Beltrami or Cass or Itasca County. So we could put in over 100 miles of four lane road in greater Minnesota for one mile of light rail. So I'm glad this last year we kind of peeled back on the light rail stuff. Um, you know, Greater Minnesota is not going to be paying for that anymore. But to get back to your your question more, there is definitely a fight between what the Metro gets and what Greater Minnesota gets. And uh, Matt and I are definitely fighting to get some more money up here. Mm -hmm. With the way the leadership is now in the House and the Senate, you've got Senator Gazelka, who's a Greater Minnesota senator, who's the majority leader now. You have Kurt Doubt, who's a Greater Minnesota representative. So they do have that greater focus on Greater Minnesota, which greatly benefits, you know, Bemidji, Grand Rapids, all of our communities up here. So it is getting better, but there's more work to be done. One of the other things that we've seen in recent weeks is the possible revisiting of toll roads and kind of looking into that a little bit further. Right last year, there was an order that MnDOT kind of study those toll road systems and now that first report's out and now he's kind of turning it over to you guys to decide if it should be investigated further. Is that something that you've heard a lot of discussion about yet or probably not? I, I haven't heard a whole lot of discussion about it. Uh, you know, I, I lived for a while when I was in the military in Virginia Beach and they had toll roads down there. And, you know, I can I can see the uh, some some benefit to them, you know, especially on the main thoroughfares through the, the, the city where don't take up the, the main arteries, but if you're going to build more lanes, have them toll roads and have pay for them that way. So I, I'd be open to the discussion. I'd have to look at the finances and the numbers and, and just, you know, I, I'm open to the discussion. And that's something I haven't heard anything additional yet. Maybe when we get into session, they'll, they'll talk the about report. it, but it's, it's not something that that's really come yeah, up in, in our realm yet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move forward to education. Last year there was a lot of movement on education. Mm -hmm. So yep. were you pretty proud of what was accomplished? I mean, do you think that's kind of what you wanted? I was very proud of what was accomplished. I was very proud as well. The, the teacher licensure reform mm -hmm. was absolutely huge. Again, for Greater Minnesota, um, and now it's a tiered system. Um, there's going to be a new uh, teacher licensure board. That's, that's, that's People are getting appointed for that now, and we're going to go through a confirmation process for some of that. But it's really going to allow schools in greater Minnesota that have a hard time recruiting teachers to have some other options. It's going to allow people that maybe they went to school in North Dakota and, and didn't get their degree in Minnesota. Now it's going to give that person an opportunity to come back to Bemidji, come back to Grand Rapids, and have an easier time getting into a school here. It should help solve some of our teacher shortages. So I was actually, you know, really excited about the final product of that bill. Uh, it, it would start. It started being worked on before Representative Bliss and I even and got elected. Mm -hmm. But okay. you know, we we got to be able to be involved in some of the discussions throughout session a little bit last year to help tweak it. And I, and I think it was a really good product that came out. And the additional funding that we got for the the schools, the two and two, that helps out. That helps out a lot. And, so it's two percent over two year, two 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 years of two percent. Correct. correct. So it yeah. ends up being like what is it two forty five a student I think get the most yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I saw numbers that Bemidji got three million. Two point seven yeah, million 2. for 7. Bemidji. Yep. Cass Lake Bina I think got six hundred and seventy plus six hundred seventy thousand plus. Walker Hackensack Akeley was three hundred and sixty thousand. Right. That that students. helps a lot. And you know even. Uh, you know, the transportation sparsity bill that we fought for in the House and Senate, you know, that helps out Bemidji a lot. It, it was a drop in the bucket, uh, but it's a drop and it's starting um, and it's there for, it's, it's a permanent part of the calculation now. So we'll, it'll always be added to, or it could always be added. I want to talk, just make sure that we said what it was. Okay, so that's like where these school districts, Bemidji in yep. particular, so large that they actually lose money transporting their kids versus the money that they get from the state. Right. The, the, the way the old calculation worked is that a, Bemidji, I believe it was Roseville, was the number, the school district they used. Same number of students, uh, much smaller, more compact area. And, and Roseville was actually taking money from their transportation budget and using it in their general fund, where Bemidji had to take money from their general fund because they have such a large area to transport. 
So what we did is I believe there was 80, 80 schools in Minnesota that that was affecting. And, and we went through and, and we, we tried to get the whole number in there, but of course, as, as time went on, it got whittled down. I believe we were at 18% was the final number. Okay. So that, that's where we But you're saying now. that because it's an actual line item in the budget that it's not a one-time right. funding. Right. In the past, they've gotten a one-time funding bump, but then the next year it was gone. We, what we've done is it's, it's there permanently. Okay. And, and according to the people that I've talked to in the school district, that's something they've been working on for 10 years or more. And, and we were able to, to, and it was a fight. It was a fight to get it was in there. Uphill? Yeah. yeah, it was. It, it, we, it, got, it was in and out and in and out, and it finally ended up in in the last minute. But yeah, that's something we both fought hard for. And being on education, I was able to be in the room for some of those discussions mm -hmm. to make sure that that stayed in there. Because that was, I think, the two and two was probably one of the biggest things we heard from school districts right. overall. But in Bemidji, it was the transportation was probably just barely above that. Is that one of the topics, though, that kind of highlights kind of, I don't want to say gridlock down at the state capitol, but some of the problems, like you have this, it's pretty obvious, right? You have a winners and a losers from the transportation budget system, and yet you have legislators that don't necessarily want to give up the money because it impacts their it mm -hmm. impacts their district. So how do you kind of navigate that? How do you hurt, cross those hurdles? Uh, you got you got to be uh, bullheaded, and you can't take no for an answer. And that's uh, one thing I learned. I was, I'm, I'm a nice guy, and I went down there generally trying to be a nice guy. And and sometimes you have to, you know, stick your head into a room even though they don't want to see you. And, okay. and you have to, to repeat what you've already told them three or four times. Okay. I would agree with that sentiment. And it's just that that entire job is about building relationships. Yeah. And, you know, in an education, being on both of those committees, I spent a lot of time outside of our committees, you know, going to have lunch with the chair of the committee, that kind of thing, it, to, to continue to let them know what's important to us up here and that those little things go a long way and so those are areas we tried to work hard on to make sure that we could get things like this transportation to stay in there. Mm -hmm. All right um, we touched on this a little bit earlier in the bonding bill but I kind of want to pull it out because it's such a big issue yeah. out here and that's the veterans home. Yeah. Um, we've actually done a full show on it so you made some progress. Do you mm -hmm. feel like you made progress? I think we made a lot of progress. I th uh, you, the governor is now addressing it when he puts out his budget for the uh, bonding bill. He specifically uh, mentions the reason there was no veterans homes in Because it wasn't funded by it, but he had kind of pointed to it. Well, we, it, it, we had initially put it in the, uh, the last uh, state gov finance bill and it was removed at his request. Okay. Um, and, and it had been in b uh, versions of bonding bills in the past, uh, but, but it's, it's actually got our, both leadership's full attention and it's, it's gotten uh, attention from the governor now as well. Okay. I think the governor's comment was they didn't have a location yet, which is a little bit offensive to people in this community, and I completely agree with it because they've been working hard on this project for yeah. about 10 years. Um, you know, they're, they're ready to put shovels in the ground as soon as they get their money. I mean, this project is ready to go, and it's a great project of great regional and state significance. Um, I think we've probably made more progress, and I hope Matt agrees with me, in the last year than probably the previous eight years. Um, I think there's probably a better chance than ever to actually see that veterans home be included in a final bill. There's uh, a desire from both bonding chairs to see that there's a veterans home in the bill. So mm -hmm. it's probably going to end up being just like the transportation we just talked about. It's going to be a fight till the end. But, you know, I would say it's, it's probably a number one issue. They, they say, oh, the veterans home. Yeah, we know. Mm -hmm. And that's good. We're going to keep that pressure on because it's I would say it's no, number one issue for me, and I believe it is for Representative Bliss as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on to MINLARS, um, which stands for the Minnesota Licensing and Registration System. Um, kind of turned out to be a little bit of a rocky launch for that. So it started off, it was going to cost $93 million, and now it's going to cost an additional $43 million. So what do you do with that? Well, that's what they're requesting is another $43 million. We're actually requesting, uh, that's another one of those swag numbers, uh, I believe, okay. that the government comes up with once in a while. Once, once we actually start for asking for details, the numbers magically goes down. You know, uh, first, before I get into any of the details, I want to shout out to those county registrars over there that, that put up with it and have been doing it for, for a while now. Uh, to, for us as a state to put them in that situation is just incomprehensible and, and unforgivable. We've, this project's been going on for about nine or ten years now. And they said, they, the project manager for that project said it was green, it was gold, let's throw it out there, and it fell flat. And, and uh, one of the comments I heard just recently, and it, it kind of stuck with me, is we didn't think there could be another project in the state that made Minsure rollout look good. 
and this is this I, I have an IT background I'm a certified project manager in IT so this just kills me to watch what's happening with this and the lack of response that we're getting from from certain people they, they put in a website now for comments that that is actually the the people the registrars can load per particular problems and they do get addressed so they're working on it there's some people down there that are actually working hard on it okay. do you feel like though that there's a path to fixing it the path needs to be more than just money that's for sure mm -hmm. and I, I know I'm not on transportation as you mentioned but I, I think they are really drilling down uh, the Senate actually set up a website for people to go and actually put in their comments about it I think there's a larger issue here and I think there's probably a leadership issue at that state agency and mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned the shout out to the deputy registrars but I would say the dealers as well I mean there's a lot of dealers that are having a very very tough time and it falls back on their hands because the consumer assumes that it's their fault when it's really not and we've we've created this terrible issue in Minlars as a state and I, I think there is a pathway forward and we're definitely working on it but there's going to be a lot of discussion around that this year so as we get to our final minutes here, I do want to just ask, you know, what did you learn last year that's really going to help you, do you think, moving forward in the weeks and months to come here? Well, I, I can tell you just for myself, one of the things I, I learned is uh, you have to advocate yourself for your priorities. And you, you, people down there have different priorities. It's not that they're bad people or trying to, to uh, take stuff away from you, but their priorities are different than yours. So if something's important, you have to go, like I said, stick your head in the door where you're not wanted and you have to become that squeaky wheel. And that's what I've learned. Making, making uh, relationships down there, like you said, going to lunch with different, different legislators, even on the other side, you know, it's, it, it's really powerful if you can get a bill with bipartisan support. And, and you, it's just making relationships and becoming a lobbyist for your area. I can certainly agree with Matt's sentiment, and, and I think the same thing. And for me, one thing that was really uh, surprising when I, when I got elected, I always thought it was going to be Democrat versus Republican mm -hmm. butting head, and it's not that at all. It's rural versus metro. Of course, I work great with Representative Bliss and Senator Rutke and Representative Grossel over here. We're all on the same side, but on the other side of my district, it's the edge of the Iron Range. So I'm the farthest, the farthest northeast Republican, so on that side of the district, I'm working with you know, Senator Tomasoni and Representative Metza and, and some of those guys. And it's been important to build relationships with them, being part of the range delegation and understanding their issues. Um, there's a lot of areas we're able to come together on because our areas are so similar in so many ways that, again, it's back to relationship building. That's, that's really what this job is, is building relationships. And I've been working very hard on that throughout the last year just to make sure that keep building and fostering those so we can get stuff done that truly is good for the area and not what is good for partisanship. So, Well, listen, I want to thank you guys for coming on and talking with us. Uh, let us know what's coming up in the weeks and months to come. I want to thank you for tuning in, and I also would encourage you to take advantage of using these email addresses on the bottom of the screen because these two men represent you, and they'd like to hear from you. So thank you for tuning in. Please join me next time.